his name, praise his name to the ends of the earth. sudden I realize I'm supposed to get up here find you somebody that you haven't greeted since Sunday or at all and greet them tell them you're glad they're here leave your zip code as pastor Renee says glory 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 You know, not only is it fun, not only does it strengthen you and is it enjoyable, but did you know it's a command? Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, Paul wrote. Amen. And it's not an option. You can be seated, glory to God. But I'm talking to the choir. Well, I literally am, aren't I? I'm talking to everybody. <laughs> we, uh, you already are rejoicers. You're already here. So I, I want to encourage you. Turn to Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. Let's receive our evening offering. I want to thank all of you so much for being here. For Brother Jesse, those of you that didn't get to be here watching online, uh, he was in rare form, and he told us afterwards, he said, I love coming here. I just enjoy it. So he's got his office already getting ready to call Terry with a date to get back down here again. So it was it was enjoyable time. Thank you. We had pastors from out of town, different ones, and it was good to see him, and uh, Brother Jesse puts those little one-liners in there. And, I, you know, I, I do that, but I run about 50 of them together. That wasn't that funny, Matt. I mean, you know. But we've had a good... How many of you know we're supposed to have fun? It's church. You know, we're supposed to have fun and have a good time. So... Turn to Deuteronomy 8, let's be obedient, get your offerings ready, and, and let's so you are such a giving church, you're such a blessing to the kingdom and the things that we want to get done. I told you the box back here that Tiffany did us the artwork and got it all set up back there and all like that already for our pavement, uh, over 21,600 has come in out of the 35,000. So man, we're two thirds of the, I get, is that, we're a long way towards getting it done. And getting there, so thank you for your obedience. Be obedient to what he said. This is your tithes and offerings, though. This is what we're giving that we operate to minister to, to help do the poor, do the different things. And, and by the way, I, I see Casey here and the team that goes out on Saturday. Pastor Lee has 
has supplied chairs for them to set up for the people uh, and, and to be able to feed and minister, have a service of there. But those chairs, those metal chairs get really hot in the sun. So if you've got an extra canopy or an ice chest, see Casey and take that down there because, you know, they, they come and they sit on the chairs, but how many of you are dancing around in the chair sometimes is not the Holy Ghost? It's hot. And so, and Pastor Lee's got the chairs there, but to get, to be able to minister and do it effectively. And so if you've got any of those things laying around, get it to them and get it over there. And someone said, well, I don't have it laying around. Well, then take it down there full of ice and water. Who got I didn't even get an amen on that. All right, put your offering. Look at Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. It says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers at, all, at this day. Have you noticed he gives us the ability to produce wealth so that he can establish his covenant? You know what that tells me? I'm involved. I get to be co a partnered with God. I get to be a co-laborer with God. He establishes covenant, but I get to be a part of that. And your giving does that. Your giving makes you and I partners together in this. So put your offering in your hand and fully expect the Lord to keep his word because he's faithful and he will give you the ability to produce wealth, increase fruit. Father, we thank you that as we sow this seed, we do so in obedience to you. We do so because we love you. And Father, not only in obedience to love, we willingly do this. And you said when you're willing and you're obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. So Father, I thank you for pastoring a church where the people eat the good of the land. They are willing, they're obedient, they serve you, they, they are diligent and stable with what they do. We thank you for it. We sow this seed in faith in Jesus' precious name. And everyone agrees? Amen. Amen. Ushers minister to the people. Hear Brother Matt.
life. Hallelujah. Thank you, sweetie. Glory to God. Thank you. One voice and one sound. You can be seated. Glory to God. I am so proud of you coming. Let me furnish air condition for you, air conditioner for you for a while. I wonder if we turned it off, if people would still come. You know, some of you had to think about that. Shame on you. We're going to have an altar call. No, don't turn it off for a day. I'm still here. Don't turn it off. <laughs> uh, glory to God. But get your Bibles. We uh, started a teaching. I want to encourage all of you. Brother Jesse's here and he's gone. He's off to his next meetings and stuff. That man's schedule is busier than anybody I know. Now, our next meeting, I'm going to go ahead and let you know, our next meeting is August, I think it's the 15th, a Sunday. We have a miracle service and Richard Roberts is going to be here to minister. So I want you to take everybody you know and every person you know. And I can tell you right now, I knew his dad. And Shelby and I went down, was in his home, and had him pray over us. And then I've also known Richard, and he did pick up his father's anointing. Amen. It's in a different way, a different area, a different time, but he did. So August the 15th, Sunday, he's going to be here for one service. So I want you to make, uh, make up your mind now to invite. In fact, let's just bring sick folk. Amen. You know what that is, don't you? Sick people. And bring them and have them come. So... August the 15th, Sunday morning, Richard Roberts. So we'll advertise it, get it out, so you come and be a part of that and get it all going. So uh, keep things in your prayer, keep everything going in prayer. I, uh, I got a, a text or an email from Neil Altman, and Neil was uh, saying that he was ministering to a person up in uh, Tehachapi, him and Nanette, and and out ministering in the streets and, and doing the ministry things and that person had a tumor and they w made an appointment to go to the doctor they prayed for him every day they made it a point to go by there every day and pray and when he went to the doctor the tumor that was there had not only shrunk they canceled the chemo and so those are the kind of miracles that are happening and taking place so praise god for those kind of things. And then he was talking about, I mean, I like, if you've got a praise report, please get those to me. Amen. Turn to Romans, the 14th chapter. I was doing a series and teaching prior to the 4th of July and, and was honored and privileged you would come and allow me the, to teach on independence and the Independence Day and Bible and history because our Bible is part history. And it is also prophecy for our future. And so we, and then it is how to live and to live by. And so I covered that. And then now I want to get back. And everywhere you turn, everybody's talking now about, I cannot wait. I'm so excited for things to get back to normal. But you and I know not everybody's normal is the same. In fact, some of the people I've watched and seen over the past year and a half are the exact opposite of what I would call normal. And I, I, abnormal doesn't even do it justice. Not normal is closer. But what is normal? And to each one of us here, if you think about it for a minute, because of the standards and the mores that you were raised in or the standards and the mores that you've been taught from the Word or from wherever it is you believe, the standards and the things you believe in actually cause you to think of what's normal. But that doesn't, and to your surprise and my surprise, that doesn't mean everybody believes like we do. If somebody gets healed, we rejoice. What a wonderful miracle, signs and wonders. But do you know, that's not normal to some churches. And to some people. In fact, they look at us like, oh, they did? Well, I've never seen a miracle. I love it when they say that to me. I look at them and say, are you born again? And they said, yeah. I said, well, then go home and look in the mirror. That is a miracle because you're an old creation and a brand new species of being. There is the miracle of miracles. So Romans the 14th, we're talking about because of this, what is normal? And believe it or not, in the church, our norms are supposed to be the same. 
in the body of Christ, in the church, we have a book of norms. A book of what's normal. We have it written down for us. So get your, your, your normals in your hand, your Bible, hold it up, move it around at the devil. Then let's pray. Father, we thank you that this is your word, and it's my word, and it's a living word. And we not only re believe it and receive it and accept it, we know it was inspired. And it was directed by your spirit to us. And tonight, Father, we yield ourselves into your hands for that word to come alive, that word to be illuminated, that word to continue to take root in our hearts and produce change in a mindset that is after the things that you've ordained, a mindset that is after you, our, our affection set on things that are above and not things of this earth. So, Father, we thank you for a revelation. We thank you for insight. We'll give you all the glory and the honor and the credit for everything said and done and what happens in Jesus' precious name. And everyone agrees? Amen. Amen. So Romans 14, what is normal? Going and returning to normal. But before I do that, let me tell you a joke. I haven't told you a joke in a while. If you've been missing for a while and you're just getting back and say, well, you told a joke the last time I was here. Well, I haven't told one in a while. I'm just joking. But there was this guy, and he won the lottery. So he got excited because he was thinking, I can finally fulfill one of my lifelong dreams, and that was to buy a horse. Always wanted a horse, but he didn't know what to buy. He didn't know what kind he wanted or needed. So he went to a high-end stable, because remember now, he had won the lot. So he went to a high-end stable, and he said, I want to buy a horse. And the stable owner and the, that was there, and he said, well, what kind of horse do you want? And the guy said, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What kind is there? And the stable owner looked at him, and he said, well, there's a type A horse. And a type A horse is a thoroughbred, a worker, a racehorse. And they just get out and they are, they are there and they are very active. And he said, oh. And he said, and then there's a type B horse. And he pointed over to one. And he had a thoroughbreds out in the field. He pointed over to one that, and he was eating hay. And he said, that's a type B horse. They just eat hay and they're companions. They're good for just companionship. And the guy said, okay. And then he looks, and there's a horse out in the lake. And it's walking around, swimming around. He said, well, what kind of horse is that out there? And the guy looked at him and said, that's a seahorse. <laughs> oh, bad. I had some of you going for a minute. I know it's bad, but, you know, you try to come up with some clean ones on a regular basis that you can tell. Come on, all right. What one person calls normal, another person may not. What one individual says, well, man, I can't wait for things to return to normal, and then when things start changing a little bit, it looks to you and I like it's a long way from it, and they go, Whew, things are back. We're going, what's back? And so normal is different to each individual. Look at Romans 14 and 5. It says, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. So right there is two people that look at days differently. One, what's normal to them is they esteem every day the same. Another one says, no, no, no. What's normal is there is one day that's above other days. And notice that Paul writing to them didn't deal on who was right or who was wrong. He didn't deal on wrong or right. He just says this. Look what he goes on to say. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, if you look at that right off the bat, you get to thinking, well, one that thinks days are higher than the other thinks that's normal. But the other guy would not. But the other guy thinks every day is the same, and the other one would not. He didn't correct that. He just said, let each of you have yourself fully convinced 
in your mind. That's called something. It's called mindset. So right off of the bat, you see from here, and I define normal for you already in the teaching, and I'm going to cover a little bit of it as we go. But normal means usual, regular, common, or typical. And I was amazed the first time I went to the Philippines for Brother Copen. It was I had gone to Venezuela, but other than that, I'd never been out of the country. And I went to the Philippines and all. What's normal in the Philippines is not necessarily normal here. The family unit, the ways they look at things, the different areas, it's not the norm here. I can remember the first time I, I came up and I was in Manila and I was out walking. I always, before anything, any meeting or anything like that, I like to walk in the, where I'm going to minister and get the spirit of what's going on. And, pray like that. and I walked up to a signal light and I'm standing there outside the hotel walking around. And this family comes up, it's time to cross, and all the kids just grab my hands. They walk across the street, let go of my hands and go. And I, I just stopped, and as Brother Copen said, I, won't, I just wanted to go, well, all right. That was cool. That was nice. That was normal. It was abnormal to me or not, but it was normal to them. And so what Paul's saying here is, you and I look at normal differently, but all of it has to do with your mindset. What you're fully convinced in your mind. So normal, and what is normal, and listen, I've seen a lot of people, and I don't mean this in an ugly way, oh, I guess I do. I've seen a lot of people lately that just, aren't, they're not normal. They ain't nothing normal about them. They don't think normal, they don't act normal, uh, they don't speak normal, they don't talk normal. And I'm, that's just the politicians. That's not even dealing with everybody else. I said I wasn't going to do that. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't, I didn't pull any certain ones. Just some people, if their mouth's moving, you know something weird and freaky's coming out. But to you and I, it shouldn't be that way. There should be a mindset that determines normal. Your mindset and my mindset determines what's normal to us. Pastor Renee, if he says he's going to go out to eat, and he, he says, let's, let's go out to your favorite place, he'll drive me over to East Bakersfield to where I'm making sure I'm packing. <laughs> and it's going to be so spicy hot, my ears are smoking. But if he wants me to take him to what's normal with a Texas boy, I'm looking for some chicken fried chicken with gravy. Some rolls and green beans or fried okra. You know, it don't put any steam out. Now, I mean, it fills your arteries with cholesterol, but it doesn't put any steams out in, in anything. So what's normal is different, but that doesn't make him wrong and me right, or me wrong, and him right, that just makes our mindset a little different. The problem that we have is when everybody wants everybody else to have their mindset and their standard and their mores or their beliefs are not based on the same thing. That's why we have the Bible. That's why as a Christian, normal shouldn't have to be defined to us. It should be what we are and we already have it written down. In fact, to get away from the word is abnormal. So Paul's saying, if you're going to be normal, then you will have this mindset. You'll be fully convinced in your mind and that will be your mindset. Turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Look at verse 23. Ephesians 4, 23. Jesse comes and has a good time. He gets me all excited. I want to preach. I want to say, sit down, it's my turn. Number one, I would never ever do that, but I have had the honor and privilege of team teaching with a lot of Wonderful men of God that's called it. But it was at their choice, not me interjecting myself. But look at Ephesians 
Now, you, let me make a little note to you. The Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, most theologians agree, was probably the most mature church at that point in time. They, they were written about like the Grand Canyon of Scripture and the beauty and Christ in you. And they, they had all of this tremendous teaching here. But Paul had to tell a mature, believing church to do something. And look what he said to do. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now we know Romans says, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will know what is the acceptable, good, and perfect will of God. Now we know that's what Romans 12, 3 says to do, but here he doesn't say renew your mind. He says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And the spirit of your mind goes along with mindset, and to fully get the, what he's saying there, the attitude, atmosphere, and mindset coupled together. Listen to the Amplified in Ephesians 4.23. Be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now here's your mind constantly being renewed in the spirit. Having the, a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. Amen. So being renewed in the spirit of our mind is not only having an established and set mindset, we need to remove our mind and keep fresh our mental and spiritual attitude. An attitude is nothing more than fixing an axis, and that's your reference point. An attitude indicator in the plane, it, it, it has a line drawn through the middle of it, uh, drawn through here, and drawn through here, and that is your attitude, and it sets the attitude of it, and it's all based on a plane, a horizontal axis that's there. You and I have an axis that should be our stabilizing factor, and that should be what sets our attitude. And we are supposed to renew ourselves in a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. So now we see it's not just a mindset, it's an attitude. Now how many of you, this is not a trick question, I'm not talking about you, and I hope you're not talking about me, but how many of you know somebody that needs an attitude adjustment? Hold your hand up now, I want to see, because if you don't, you don't get out. Somebody don't let you have friends at all. We all have it. And you know what? It's not my job or your job to fix their attitude. It's, your, it's their job to renew themselves with a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. But we all know some people with attitude. We all know them. Now, some people we know have good attitude. And then, of course, we know some that don't. What is it Zig Ziglar said? They need a checkup from the neck up for hardening of thinking and stinking attitudes. Is that right? Is that close? Renee's going close enough. <laughs> a checkup from the neck up for stinking thinking and hardening of attitudes. That's it. And normal is not before the checkup. Normal is when we get into the same mindset. So to have the same mindset. Now, all of this is normal to a Christian. Everything I'm talking about is what is normal. Normal is a mindset that's been renewed by the Word of God with a mental and spiritual attitude that's in line with the Word. Not our own self. I mean, I have people sometimes, and in, in, in I'll say, you know, sometimes we have to work on our attitudes. And they'll look at me and say, well, that's just me. That's just me. And I go, I know. That's why I'm trying to help you. Oh, it's definitely you. That's why nobody wants to be around you. Let's keep it fun now because we're getting into some stuff here in a minute. So the Amplified says, be fresh mental and spiritual attitude. So your mindset and your attitude mentally and spiritually come into play. Now turn to Philippians 1. 
So mindset, mental and spiritual attitude, and then now Philippians 1.27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. Now that's not talking about extramarital affairs. That's talking about hearing about how you're conducting yourself, because he just talked about conduct. And he's saying there that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So now we see conduct comes into play. So I looked up the word conduct, and to, to my surprise, it's just a real simple definition, even in the Greek. How you act and how you are. How you display yourself is conduct. Well, that wasn't a new revelation. I'm thinking, well, hey, the Greek and the English is about the same on that. How you conduct yourself. Attitude is a mental position in regards to the state of your mind. And character is what comes out when you have a mindset and a certain mental and spiritual attitude, then you conduct yourself a certain way because of that mindset, attitude, and the way you're thinking. When you do that, you become the character that you're conducting yourself as. That's why they look at somebody and say, ooh, what a character. They base that on conduct. But their conduct is controlled by their mindset and attitude. Everybody's still with me on this. We, we are going somewhere. And then in Philippians 2, 2, turn over there to the next chapter of Philippians. He said, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So let me put it all together again so we can see this. People, a people, a person, a church, us, that are like-minded, whose attitude and mental thinking and mindset lead us to the same conduct that is becoming the gospel of faith. When we do that, we are united together in the love of the Lord and the gospel and things start happening. Things start coming about because of that. We're one mindset. It's called unity, but it, unity has a little different connotation. The mindset, the attitude, mentally and spiritual, and not only that, the renewing of our spirit of our mind so that we in love and walking in the love of God and the gospel of faith, as we get that working in us, it causes us to conduct ourselves a certain way. And that way we conduct ourselves is by our mindset, our attitude, and that becomes normal. But unfortunately, you and I have seen people's conduct that's called unbecoming. Unbecoming what? It's evidently normal to them or they wouldn't be conducting themselves there. So what is it unbecoming to? It's unbecoming to you and I. It isn't becoming someone we want to be like. The church, Christians, we ought to conduct ourselves with the right attitude, the right mindset to where that's so normal with us that people want to become Christians, church members, people, amen? And so what is normal is only to get us into one mind and one accord. What is normal is what the Word says we are and what the Word declares that we can or can't do it's all, the word's about do's. It's not about don'ts. You remember that everybody takes it, train a child up in a way that it should go and it'll not depart. But that's, most people say, well, train that child where he doesn't do that. That is not what it says. Train him up in the way he should go. Amen. And he'll not depart. So it's a positive spin on that. Everybody with me on that. And the spirit that we're supposed to get into one mindset is the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So everybody still with me. So your attitude your mindset, your conduct forms your character. Whether we like it or not, we are a character. 
If you hadn't been told that, let me tell you, you guys are characters. And you're sitting under a pastor that's a character. Now, hopefully, all of us are thinking the same mindset, the same thing, that it's a good character. So attitude, character. And by the way, the character actually means the attributes and the features that make and distinguish a person. So your character is the a actions and the attitudes that distinguish you. Is everybody with me on that? So we're going somewhere. We've been there before, but we're going. So let's think about for a minute what most of the church tries to do is we try to tell everybody how to think or we try to tell everybody how their conduct should be and we try to do the two without putting them together. Now let me say what I mean by that. We try to get their attitude adjusted by uh, through their thinking. Get your thinking. Here's what you should think, 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 think. Next thing you know, they're only thinking what you're telling them to think. And then we say, don't do, don't do, don't do. And we keep laying down laws. And then if they miss it on one of those, they get so much guilt and condemnation, they forget there's power in the blood, there's forgiveness in the blood, there's repentance in the blood. And we can change from that. And the two of them, and so they try to beat the conduct up or beat the thinking up. And you're supposed to renew your thinking. And when you do that with the same mindset, then we lovingly, change our conduct together because of the thinking and the attitude change. Then all of a sudden the character is changed. And it plays out in a certain way. Now turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at something here. Instead of talking about all the others' attitude, your mental and spiritual attitude, your mindset, I chose to start on conduct. I know this is not a shock to all of you, but our conduct, the way we act, or the things we do, it all should be the same. We're in the same family, same mindset in the Word, the same Lord, the same Jesus, the same, for the lack of a better way, standards and mores. So we ought to be thinking, acting, and conducting ourselves alike. But you and I know that's just not so. It can be and it will be, and I believe that some are closer to it than a lot of others are, and that includes you. So when we looked at conduct that is normal by the Bible, the first conduct trait or first character trait, the first thing that signifies a person that's normal is number one, diligence. And we spent some time talking about diligence. I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to be, uh, I know it's an army term, be all you can be in the kingdom of God, in Christ. If you want to be what the word says you can be, it isn't going to happen because you just say, I believe. I believe that I receive. You have to be diligent to add to your faith. All those things that Peter talked about, you have to have diligence. And the word says to not be diligent is to be slowful. In other words, a diligent person will grow, will mature, will have character changes. But not, I mean, you've heard me tease that the scriptures don't say sit you, they say go you. But you can only go you if there's diligence there. And I made it a billy bit, I'll give it to you again. A person that regards everything as a burden will not be a diligent worker. They just won't. How can they be a diligent worker? Because everything's such a pain. Everything's so, it's such a burden. Oh, it's such a burden. Listen, that's why Jesus said, come to me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is, my, it's light, and it's easy. And the translation said it's not burdensome. He'll take that with us, but we still have to take the yoke and learn of him. So we still have to be diligent. So the word diligent means earnestness, zeal, and making haste. 
So the first thing, the first trait, the first thing we talked about and spent time on it is diligence. To have the norm, can you imagine if you're here and you're a business owner, if everybody that is in your team and staff were diligent? Think about that for a minute. Wow, you don't even have to ask for something to get done. Bam, it's done. You don't even think they're they're going out and doing things diligently, like the one with five talents, the work one two talents, and the one with one that just hit it. The whole thing is diligence to do something. And the sir, the master said, if you do just even bear, uh, put it in the bank and let the bank do the work, I would have accepted that. But he hit it, did nothing, no diligence. But the next thing that we touched on before we stopped and had the fourth and Brother Jesse in here is another common trait, another normal trait. If you uh, look at the person to your left and right and say, boy, you're normal. (laughs) All right, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Do it again and act like you mean it this time. All right, everybody look up here at me. I want you to say, Pastor, you're normal. And you're normal. But normal biblically is a good thing. Not a bad thing. The second trait, though, is stability. To stabi- I mean, here's another question. I want to see a show of hands, and it doesn't. It's not a trick question. I'm not going to come up to you after and say, who is it? How many of you know some people that are so up and down, wishy-washy, in and out, unstable, like crazy. How many of you know some people like that? Okay. Again, those that didn't raise your hand, you don't ever get out, do you? You can't get on the road without seeing some unstable drivers. They, I think they come to Bakersfield to learn to drive without stability. But stable. Now, here's what the word stable means. Constant and steadfast in character or purpose. Strength to stand, but here's the one I like the most. Stable means, again, let me me give it to you. Constant and steadfast in character or purpose. Strength to stand to limit fluctuations. Wow, I don't fluctuate, I'm just flexible. No, you're not bending, you're moving. There's a big difference. You're not just bending, you're, oh, I don't like it here, bam, I'm over here. Well, I don't like it there, I'm up. You are fluctuating, and I'm going to make a statement, and I challenge any of you to prove me wrong, any of you to take the Bible and prove me wrong, more damage is done to the non-believer looking to be a believer by in unstable, fluctuating Christians than anything else. More damage. Thank God it's none of you. Amen. You better say amen. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I am actually hurrying, but where did the time go? I've just got to where I wanted to start. Didn't I just finish my joke a second ago? It seems like, where did time go? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The church and the people in the church that make up the church, which be essence, we should be stable and unmovable, fixed, steadfast in our faith, in our conduct, in our mindset, and in our attitudes. Always in love, the love of God, and that manifesting itself out through us. The church right now, if things are going to return to normal, then the church is where the world should be looking for stability. Not fluctuating. You remember Jesus said uh, uh, the man that digs deep and, and, find, and builds his house on the rock, 
is a man that hears my word and does them, but the one that hears my sayings and doesn't do them and forgets them, he's built his house on the sand and grates the fall of it and the move. Your foundation is the word. Your foundation is Jesus, the rock. You're found. In fact, he told Peter, if you remember in Matthew 16, when he said, who do people say I am? Who do they say? And Peter said, you are the Christ the Son of God, the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My Father did. Therefore, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What's the rock? It's not Peter, like some denominations say. It is revelation knowledge from the Father that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the living God. That's what we're supposed to build on. And most Christian church believe that. But if you don't build on that rock, something stable. Do you remember? I, I won't go because of time there. Maybe Sunday we'll pick it up. Do you remember where it says Jesus is, the, in Peter, the chief cornerstone? Well, if the rock is revelation knowledge of Jesus, the Christ, then he is the chief cornerstone. A cornerstone is a stone back in that day they placed... Everything in the foundation would be built, now I'm simplifying, it would be built off of that, and that formed the whole basis of the foundation. Jesus, the chief cornerstone. And we see that, and then you and I build our house on it. And according to Peter, we are living stones, a lively people, peculiar priesthood, and we're built upon the stone, a house. So we are his living spiritual house built on the chief cornerstone. But what people leave out a lot of time is there's another stone when you're building that is called a capstone. And another word for capstone is coping stone. And that's the stone that you put on top. You got Jesus, the chief cornerstone. You and I are the building, but we must put on the coping stone of Christ here. He is the chief cornerstone, but he's the coping capstone that goes here, the head of the church. And you and I are supposed to be stable. If we're not stable, how in the world can anybody in the world want to run to us or come to us because the capstone's stable, the foundation's stable, but everything in between's all over the place. Everybody with me on that? I'm having a lot of fun. I wish I had another hour. So steadfastness, stability. I'll cover it on, on Sunday in some more detail on some things about 1 Peter. But Jesus, turn to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 37. And for tonight, just for tonight, you were so faithful to be here on Sunday night and faithful to be here Sunday morning and do these things. So I'm going to uh, make sure I stay on time tonight because uh, I'm sure you got some goodies back there. Do we have goodies back there, Lulu? All right. Is, did Martin and Marty bring the goodies? Gina brought them. I don't even know what they are. All right. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 37. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin will. Now, that means his virginity will. In other words, now watch some wording here, and I want you to grab this. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast, stable, immovable in his heart, not anything of need or necessity moving you. In fact, you have, now watch what he's saying here, you have power over his own will. So everybody look up here at me. The old flip whistle, the devil made me do it, is not going to hunt. You have, and those of you looking at me like, what's he talking about? You're too young. I don't even want to go into it. <laughs> Who's Flip Wilson? Is that a basketball player? No. Hey, I guess he could be. Anyway, the devil made me do it. Or I don't know why I do it. Let me tell you why you did it. Why you do it. Why conduct's not there. As an act of your own will, you let it get out of control. 
You didn't control your own will. So the devil made you do it. He can't make you do anything that you're not willing to do. And that you don't, with your mouth, give him the authority. He who stands steadfast, stable. I got uh, uh, so much more I, I want to go into this. Listen to the 1 Corinthians 7, 37, or, tw or yeah, in the Amplified, and then I'm going to close. Whoever is firmly established in his heart, firmly established in his heart. Now, we're seeing what stability is now. We already know what diligence is. Now, this is stability. Whoever is firmly established in his heart, here's what the Amplified with parentheses describes that. Strong in mind and purpose, not being forced by necessity, but having control over his own will and desire, and has resolved this in his heart to keep his own virginity. He's doing well. In other words, you can, I'm going to close with this, by an act of your will, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God working in you with Jesus, the chief cornerstone, keeping you stable as your foundation, you can control by your will your own desires and lusts. Yes, that's right. yeah. Kind of puts a needle in the conduct of, I don't know why. So steadfastness of heart, I looked this up, it means strong in mind and purpose, not compulsive, power over your own will, and determination. All of those make up steadfast. You and I are supposed to be diligent and stable. That is normal. That's not some supernatural Christian. That's just a normal believer. That's normal. We think that's, wow, boy, how strong are they? Look at the faith they have. No, they've just determined to be diligent in the things of God and to be stable in their heart and mind and attitude to the things of God. So they conduct themselves that way. And some people even in churches think they're weird. And I shared this on Sunday, and I'm going to, I mean, last time I ministered this on Wednesday a week. And then I'm going to get onto it on Sunday. The thing that hinders your steadfastness more than anything else, that that keeps you from being steadfast in your heart, having control over your will and your mindset, the thing that hinders you the most in it is your feelings. Your emotions. You know I'm telling you that. You know that's not only Bible. I'm telling you the truth. I'm going to prove it to you. Your emotions, your feelings. I mean, the song feelings, you know. So, I mean, so, watch this. I'm going to leave you with this. So many people are so controlled by their feelings that they get to thinking they are the person that they feel like. You understand where I'm going, what I'm saying with that? You get your emotions overcome you and your feelings. That they, if you feel like, I know some people, you know, I, I'm just sick. I just feel like I'm sick. I just feel like I'm sick all the time. And then eventually you will become a sick person. Because your feelings overcome. How do you think the certain communities of gay and different things when so many people, they get them to feel a way, and then when they start feeling that, that's how they think they are. And it's not the truth. It's a lie that's been bought into because of this. So Sunday, we're going to go into that a little bit more. Now, now, listen to me, your feelings are okay until you live your life by them. And you need to understand, your feelings will betray you. And I use aircraft and an attitude indicator because you can be in a plane in a thunderstorm and you can think you're flying good and you're upside down. 
especially, I, I mean, I was flying my Baron, my twin engine into to Lester Summerall's ministry, and I got caught into a thunderstorm, and I didn't even know it. There was a tornado come out, and next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I was upright and, and, and everything else like that. My feelings were telling me I were, but my instruments was telling me I was upside down. So you trust your instrument. You trust what it says. So I took and did what I needed to right side it up. And then when I broke through some clouds, 10 miles, it threw me 10 miles in a second or two. When I came back to what the instrument said was right, I came out of the clouds and lo and behold, I was right side up. My feelings told me I was upside down. So that's instrument flying. You're taught to learn to not go. Christians need to understand your emotions and your feelings are good, but if that's all you trust, it will make you unstable. Because your feelings will lie to you. You may have come in here today and listened to this and thought, Pastor Billy don't love me. Your feelings are lying to you. I love you with all my heart. In fact, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Amen. So your feelings, they're good. You need to have them. And sometimes your five physical senses are not your enemy. If you go to the refrigerator and you grab some milk and it's got stuff all in it and smells like it's not good, don't to use me as your excuse to go, I'm not moved by what my emotions or feelings says and you drink it. I'm going to come visit you in the hospital. Don't, that's not... I'm, you don't ignore all of your senses, but when it comes to spiritual things, they can't be your guide. I've had people a lot of times tell me, well, I'm, I'm going to leave KCC. I said, why? They said, well, I, I don't sense the anointing there. And I said, well, okay. Wow, that's, that's serious. I said, look, can I ask you something? They said, yeah. And I said, is the word anointed? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you get the word here? Yeah, yeah. I said, then somebody's got a problem. Because if the word's anointed and you can't sense the word, then you're not listening to the word anymore. So why are you getting mad at me? Because I'm giving you the word. Because he sent his word and it healed them. See, we get a mindset, an attitude that it has to be this way. But sometimes we need to just do what the word says, whether we feel like it or not. Conduct ourselves by the word says, love people whether we feel like it or not. So diligence and stability, and then we'll go and start some more Sunday into this. Did you get anything out of this? Yes, I'm going to stop right there. We'll cover more. Stand to your feet. I know that's where you always stand to, but glory to God. This coming, uh, Pastor Renee will make all the announcements, and he'll let us uh, let you know all those things and and shell's putting together back up to where we start doing the slides prior to the service for the announcement so if you come in here one of these days and you don't have a bulletin in your hand don't get all upset read the screen Amen. and if it's on the screen and you didn't see it don't get upset your feelings are lying to you trying to get you offended because he blessed is he who is not easily offended you know, someone said, well, you don't understand what they did. If, if it could be done to offend you, then it'll be done. We have an enemy that knows what he's doing. But he's defeated. He has no authority in our life. The word does, amen. Well, say this with me, if you would. God loves you. We love you. Jesus is Lord, and love prevails over all. Are you going to make a, an announcement, babe? I just want to make a real quick announcement. So... Sunday, July 18th at 6 o'clock. There's a sign-up sheet in the back in the foyer. Um, please sign up. We're having our KCC ice cream social. You do not need to bring anything but yourself and your appetite because it is going to be very fun. We've been getting everything together. It's not just like we have so many things that are going to go on that evening, but it's going to be a good time. So please sign up at the sign-up sheet so we can get kind of a head count and that. But that's July 18th. Sunday at 6 o'clock. So come hungry, leave happy. Ice cream <laughs> social. That, I tell you what, you feed, you know, 
Some people have alcohol, some people have music, some people have all these things that draw them. To a Christian, just have some food. And we're going to have ice cream. Now, I know some of you say, well, uh, I don't like ice cream. Or ice cream don't like me. Whatever the term you want to use. But you got fellowship. Come get to it. We're open now. We can fellowship together. So Pastor Renee, come and uh, make any announcements. I said we're trying to stop them, but we're not trying to stop you. And uh, so uh, I love you guys. I'm so excited. Don't forget that we just now got what is normal introduced. Just got it introduced. Someone said, well, why can't you just get that done in one service? Are you kidding me? Do you know how much I cover? There's no way to get it done in a year. Because, see, I tried that one time. I had some people say, why don't you just do verse by verse expository preaching? So I did. I taught the book of Isaiah. It took me a year and a half. And then people said, well, you're just always saying the same thing. Well, always just this verse, this verse, this verse, you know. So I've come to the conclusion people will say what they want. I'm just going to do what the Lord says. Amen. You know why? Because you're diligent and stable. Amen. All righty, Pastor Riddell. Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap this evening. Amen. I'd like to give a shout out to, to Sherry back here. Turn around, Sherry. It's her first time on the camera tonight. Praise God. Amen. Yes, amen. We put a little piece of tape on the monitor there, and we, it's kind of the headroom, and said make sure you keep Pastor below the blue tape, and myself as well. Praise God. And so... And you see, here's the deal. The cool thing about that is she didn't miss the service. Right? Are we looking for more people? Do I hear two? Do I hear three? Do I hear four? Amen. Praise God. So thank you so much for stepping up. And Anthony would be more than delighted to put more people to work as well. We've been blessed that our youth have stepped up on Sunday mornings. And, uh, and they've, been, they've been doing an excellent job. And it's a blessing that they've been doing that as well. Allows the adults to sit down and enjoy the word as well. So uh, this Saturday, 8 a.m. is the men's breakfast. So uh, we're going to have ourselves a good time. And uh, so uh, somebody said amen back then. Was that Daryl that said amen? Praise God. Go to the building that's closest to Gosford. And if you're not sure, just smell the cholesterol and you'll be at the right place. Amen. So that takes place this Saturday, 8 a.m. Uh, bring a friend. Just come as you are. Um, and we're going to have ourselves a good time of fellowship, and uh, we're going to hear a great testimony, and I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, that's this Saturday, men, at 8 a.m. So uh, praise God. God is so good. Amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. Father, we just thank you this evening for your word, and we thank you, Lord God, that we are so diligent and so steadfast in your word, Lord God. We thank you for the foundation of the rock of Jesus Christ that's in our lives, Lord. And I thank you for each and every person that's here tonight and those that tune in as well, Lord, and those that will watch this at a later date, Lord. We thank you that we were encouraged tonight. We were built up. We're doers of the word and not just hearers only. But I'd like to take just a quick second here. Maybe you've never been born again and you've never accepted Jesus Christ and you'd like to tonight. I would be honored to pray for you if you've never made that decision and you'd like to tonight. Just simply just raise your hand, wave it towards me, and I'd be honored to pray for you. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. House full of believers. What a wonderful thing. Now, we thank you tonight as we go home. We thank you the angels of God have charge of us. And we thank you for a wonderful rest tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, God bless you. We'll see you this week. Brother.